No. Uh, anything you'd like to say to the audience, Ben? No. <laughs> <sighs> and anything you'd like to say to the audience, Christina? Yeah. What would you like to say? I saw you the park, Sugar House Park. She saw me at Sugar House Park, and we hope you'll see us at Sugar House Park, too, in September. A round of applause for our young guests. Thank you so much. Okay, you can step right over there. Bye bye. Hey, listen, this is really important. If you have family or friends who can't watch the show, have them go to www.hotm.tv right now and click on streaming video. Now, here's the important thing for tonight we're doing beta testing because we are trying to expand our broadband use and we think that we can uh, bring in a lot of a streaming video viewers and so we need to test that so I want to ask you if you're computer literate and you have the on online keep your TV on watch the show through the TV if you want or through your computer but please go to your computer right now type in www.hotm.tv go to the streaming video click watch we want to see if our beta testing will handle this because we're trying to get it out more and more and more and allow thousands to watch instead of uh, the amount that have been able to watch in the past. So help us out if you could. Help the ministry out and just go and click on streaming video at hotm.tv. All of you, if you hate us, do it. Because it'll help us. And uh, anyway, I was a born-again Mormon. Hard copy, still on back order. Uh, summer in the stores uh, still. utlm.org has it. Uh, Christ, uh, New Life Christian in Layton still has some. But remember, we recently made a PDF available to you online, downloadable. Go to www.hotm.tv and you can have the book in your hands within minutes uh, for any size donation, including free of charge. If you prefer a hardbound copy or a bound copy, uh, wait a few weeks and we'll have them available again in the stores and here on the show. All right, now, if you are into taking a beautiful ride this Saturday afternoon. We want to welcome you to the open water baptism we're holding this coming Saturday, uh, uh, 7 11 at 1 p.m. And it's going to be a great time of the uh, fellowshipping and watching people commit their lives publicly to the Lord. Um, Rendezvous Park, just south of downtown Logan. Anyone and everyone is welcome, no matter what, just as long as you're not a disruptor or an assassin or a white person dressed like an Indian. You're welcome to come and join us and be baptized. And if you don't want to be baptized, just come enjoy the festivities. How do you get there? Go online to hotm.tv. Directions are there. Or get a pen and paper right now, and I'm going to give you directions. And I want you to know where I'm sitting I am just facing, looking right up the Wasatch Mountains. I'm in Salt Lake City and I'm looking right north. So you just take the I-15 straight up to exit 362. It says Brigham City, Logan. It's the, that 362 exit. You take a right and you head toward the mountains and you stay on that road. You go through Sardine Canyon and you'll go through a, a two traffic lights. You'll cross over one set of uh, railroad tracks. And before you get to the second set of railroad tracks, look for the balloons, look for the signs. And we're right there at Rendezvous Park. Uh, one o'clock afterward, we're going to gather at a local home, a beautiful home for food. Uh, you don't need to bring anything and, uh, and, and refreshments and worship and fun. So we hope that you uh, will come and join us. Then mark your calendars for Burning Heart 09, Big Tent Revival. Bands including Adams Road from Florida, been guests here before, and Jeremiah's Fire here from Salt Lake City will be there to entertain you, to lead worship. Box lunches from Subway will be available, along with cotton candy, popcorn, inflatable things for the kids, and booths for the adults. And then we're going to head inside to a big, gigantic tent where we're going to have a, uh, a preach and teach lesson on the beauty of salvation through Jesus Christ. Uh, this event is certainly to fellowship, but we hope that if you don't know that you've been born again, if you don't know the Lord in a personal way, we don't care if you're LDS or atheist or whatever you are, if you can't say, I have been born again, we want to invite you to come to this. This is an outreach so we can share with you the simplicity and the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ and how you can be born again and experience this new life uh, in your existence. So uh, Saturday, September 5th, 
2009 Sugar House Park from 5 to 8 p.m. Everybody is welcome again, but those other people. And, and, uh, and then uh, we hope you'll join us. All right, here we go. I am so excited about this announcement. It has been in the works literally since when we first began doing Heart of the Matter over three and a half years ago. Uh, bottom line, Aletheia Ministries is launching another television program. It's going to air right here on TV 20, 10.30 p.m. on Saturday nights. Well, that's pretty late, Sean, you might say. Yes, it is for some. But that program is going to test and prompt and pull and force people to think and examine and reconsider life as we're going to address every issue under the sun, utilizing access tools like Facebook and texting and tweeting and Twittering and email and MySpace, the whole gamut. It's going to be interactive. It's going to be live. It's going to be call-in. It's going to be called the gray generation, and it will be for teenagers. Now, here's the thing, and we need your help again. We are going to be filming the opening and closing of The Gray Generation, and we need 250 students, teenagers, on the site of a high school to do this. If you are a teenager, if you own a teenager, if you uh, have a relationship to a teenager, please, please take this information down. We need as much participation from the teenage community of Utah to do this opening the right way. On Saturday, August 1st, at West High School in North Salt Lake City, we'll be filming the show's opening and closing. If you are in high school, we want you there. Please dress in black, gray, white, or a combination of those three and nothing else, no other color. If you're a jock, come looking like a jock. If you're a geek, come looking like a geek. Come looking like you appear in everyday life. If you look like a good girl, come as a good girl. If you look like a wild kid, come as a wild kid. We want all types represented. Some will be chose to play certain key roles in the entrance and exit of the show. So remember, Saturday, August 1st, we're going to be there from 8 a.m. until the latest 3 p.m. West High School, located at 400 West and about exactly north. I don't know where it is north, but it's right off uh, in the north side of Salt Lake City. We're going to provide lunch and water, and it is our hope that the Lord will take this program national. We're trying to have it reach an audience nationally, and so we're making it qualitative. We are trying to do everything right with it, and we need your help to have it happen. Go to www.hotm.tv for more information or to download a per parent permission slip, which needs to be signed when you show up. We need the entire Christian community to help us on August 1st. We're going to announce this until that date, so please pass it along. And uh, parents, if you want us to get rid of your teenagers on that day after we've used them, let us know. We'll, we'll do that too. <laughs> Just kidding you. All right. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we uh, love you and we praise you and we worship you and we thank you for this airtime. We pray your spirit will work through the airwaves for people who are seeking or struggling or yearning to know you and to have become new creations through you. And we pray for our studio audience, our listening audience, our viewing audience, wherever they may be. We pray for our volunteers, our staff, our, our uh, television station, and everything else that people stand in need of. God, we love you and pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight, we end Mountain Meadows Massacre. Though John D. Lee took one for the team, being shot through the heart by a squad of unidentified men hiding behind cab, uh, uh, whatever they were, um, the lies and deception and misery over Mountain Meadows Massacre continues even to this day. John D. Lee left behind a book called Mormonism Unveiled, which was to some extent self-serving and not wholly based on facts. Lee recreated events that, uh, in order to kind of protect his involvement. And at the same time, he castigated all the people who fingered him at the trial as the man who did all the evil. Oddly and interestingly enough, the very first Utah temple ever built, the St. George Temple, was dedicated in the wake of Lee's state-induced death. 
Instead of being a festive celebration, however, this dedication of this first temple in Utah, which interestingly enough, continued teaching the rites of swearing to shed the blood and avenge the, sh the shed blood of the prophet Joseph Smith, it was very somber. Those in atten attendance couldn't help note that Brigham Young was dark and brooding in his mood, which could have been the direct result of sending his adoptive son to an unexpected death. In his dedicatory sermon, Brigham Young, 16 days after Lee fell dead, quote, castigated the Quorum of the Twelve for resisting his economic program and called men such as Apostle Erastus Snow a curse to the community. Bagley reports from historical resources that with increasing heat, quote, Brother Brigham whipped and scolded the tradesmen and almost everybody and everything else there. In his rage, Bagley continues, Young pounded the podium with his cane, and the podium, which is still in use today, bears the marks he made upon it. A lot of what Brigham Young did bears the scars uh, even to this day. Suddenly, in the midst of Brigham Young speaking at this very first temple, and angry and pounding the podium with his cane, a freak storm occurred and nobody could hear Brigham Young speaking. And Young had to order the congregation to, um, who were fearful that Satan himself was on a rampage to, quote, sit down and calm yourselves and let the devil roar, he said. I wonder if he was speaking of himself or the storm outside. From this point on, all the blame for the Mormon Mountain Meadows massacre was put either upon the Indians or John D. Lee, Brigham Young's counselor, Daniel Wells, what a study of a guy you gotta read on that one, said, perhaps a crony or two and a lot of dupes and thieves and savages under John D. Lee's command participated. That rhetoric really makes me ill. These guys knew that stake president and a bishop was involved. They knew it, but now that Lee was dead every, and everyone else walked away scot-free from participating, this member of the first presidency said it was the work of Lee and a crony or two and a lot of dupes and thieves and savages. I hope there are angels assigned in heaven that walk around punching religious liars in the nose. <laughs> On August 23rd, 1877, Brigham Young fell ill with cramps. They said it was from eating green corn and something else, and he was dead within a week. Most experts believe he died of appendicitis. His biographer wrote that Young's last words were, I feel better. But eyewitnesses Richard Young and Dr. Seymour Young said nothing at all about him speaking any last words. Immediately after his death, the LDS-owned Deseret News reported that his last words were, Amen. A week later, in such Mormonicious, twistianity fashion, they stated that his actual last words were, Joseph, Joseph, Joseph and the Mormons ate it up with a spoon and continue to repeat it today, as though that's something honorable. Bagley notes that Young's daughter recalled that, quote, the divine look in his face seemed to indicate that he was communicating with his beloved friend, Joseph. But as far as last words, it seems like if he had any amen, was it. John Taylor assumed the office of prophet almost by default, but like Brigham Young before him, it took him almost three years to reconstitute the LDS First Presidency. With John D. Lee dead, the Mormon Mountain Meadows Massacre shifted from being a serious legal liability for the church to an ongoing public relations nightmare, and it still is. And I say good, and the more of a nightmare, the better. May the ghosts of those departed souls forever prod and remind the world that until Mormonism officially apologizes and assumes responsibility for the massacre, it should never be forgotten. Bagley reports that the horrors of the massacre forever haunted the lives of the men involved and that many of the men, quote, were decent, but they could not rest in peace after the dreadful deeds they did. Please understand what I'm about to communicate. We are all capable of doing horrible and evil things in our life under certain sets of circumstances. 
I'm not pointing a vicious finger of accusation to those beguiled participants at Mountain Meadows. What they did certainly was evil, but I've done evil things too. Their sin would fully be covered by the blood of Jesus Christ if they received it. But the political powers that still exist that continue to hide and cover and obfuscate and cloud the truth, they are the ones who need to come clean and they are the ones who should have the finger pointed at them. It's an interesting point to think about. Mormonism from the onset have presented issues for their people to embrace. And the people embrace them with all their hearts, being obedient to these men and their leaders. Remember, at one time, Mormonism led people to believe that if they didn't practice polygamy, they would not be exalted in the celestial kingdom. So then that changed, and the people who embraced polygamy were left in the dust. They bought it whole hook, line, and sinker. And then when the church said no more, they w w said, you told us we couldn't get to heaven without it. All right? Then... We had good God-fearing people believing that Adam was God. And Brigham Young taught that Adam was God. The father came down, took one of his wives, procreated with her, and then populated the earth. And people bought into that, literally. And then when that changed, they were left in the dust. People died believing that polygamy and Adam was God in this stuff. And it changed with it under the auspices of prophetic utterances. And then they got men and women to swear in temples that they would avenge the blood of Joseph Smith for their generations unto the third generation. And then after Mountain Meadows Massacre and a few other things, that changed. And so they, people, actually murdered in the name of what these prophets told them that they should do. And then they pulled back and said, no, we don't do that anymore. And then they were led to believe that black people, that God said skin color is indicative of human beings' righteousness. And a whole group of people believed these men. And they went and they, they let that seep into their heart all the way up until the 1970s. They believed this stuff. And then the church comes and says, not so, not anymore. And so we have a remnant of people walking around in this state who still hate black people, who still are prejudiced because of these very teachings. When will it end? It's not gonna. The gospel of Jesus Christ has never wavered. It's Jesus is God. He came to this earth born of a virgin. He died on a cross. He resurrected the third day. You believe on him. You are saved. That's it. There's not, none of this other stuff, but Mormonism, which claims it's Christian, has constantly thrown what they say is a perfect pitch to their people, and then they throw again, and they throw a curveball at them. And it's one of the most pernicious things in Mormonism today. What will be next? In 10 years, will they say women are supposed to have the priesthood? You men that thought it's always supposed to be just men, you're wrong. Or g gay people can't be married. That's not right. And then in 10 years, you're wrong. And, and then will they lead you down the primrose path to embrace a bunch of doctrines that are absolutely heretical? You cannot trust them. And yet they claim you won't go wrong following the prophet. How many people along the way will be sacrificed on the altar of Mormon manipulation? How many people take seriously everything these men say? Believe it. Good people believe it in their heart, want to please God through these things, and are just completely beguiled. Let me let you in on an amazing secret just on this note. Joseph Smith didn't even believe the Book of Mormon in the end. They say the Book of Mormon is the fullness of the gospel. Joseph Smith, in the end, he taught so many things that aren't even in the Book of Mormon. He didn't even buy it as the, as the a book you need. I mean, he totally burned the Bible, and then he goes to the Book of Mormon, and then when that bored him, he started coming with Doctrine and Covenants and polygamy, and then he does the Pearl of Great Price. And, and we're talking, he didn't even care about it. And yet you guys still cling to that thing. You know, it's just, it's sad, and it's amazing. As historians began to investigate the Mormon Mountain Meadows Massacre, they reported what, as LDS historians, they reported what would support the church. Deeply religious men to protecting the church began to rewrite history, omitting uh, certain things. They had a syllogism that they believed, and a syllogism is kind of this thinking that they do, and it would be like, Brigham Young was a prophet, prophets can't murder, therefore, Brigham Young was not responsible for Mountain Meadows Massacre. It's simple, that, the logic's perfect. Um, Mormonism 
is full of syllogisms, and it's the logic, logical, pro, the illogical process that they go through to justify their belief in things. For instance, Mormonism makes me feel good. Feeling good must be of God. Mormonism is therefore of God. And all these little things they convince themselves of, and if you have a discussion with the missionaries, uh, they will confirm these types, uh, this type of thinking. The syllogism and the application of them are endless. Well, anyway, other historical accounts were written on the Mountain Meadows Massacre. Uh, it began with a guy named Rogerson, and he was then met with a guy named Charles Penrose, who wrote a re LDS rebuttal to Rogerson's report. And that became the standard for the LDS Church, Penrose's rebuttal that he gave verbally. Then a guy named Bancroft penned the history of Utah, and he pretty much used the Penrose account. Then a Jensen, then B.H. Roberts, another historian, wrote about it. And then two Josiahs wrote about it. One pro for the church, one con. I'm not going to take the time to discuss them. I'm not going to take the time to discuss Juanita Brooks, who wrote one of the best books about the Mormon mountain massacres. Uh, but, and the terrible difficulty she had as someone who believed in Mormonism, but was faced with the facts and revealing those facts. When we talk about what happens to people who step out against Mormonism down toward the end of the year, we're going to talk about, fun, uh, about Juanita Brooks and uh, what happened with her. But the personal fallout was terribly hard on her as a believing Mormon who only spoke the truth. So Mormonism then and now, official and unofficial, continues to deny and avoid and present all kinds of fluff in an effort to cloud the reality of the Mormon Mountain Meadows Massacre. When distinguished Mormon historian Leonard Arrington penned his work, The Great Basin, in the 1970s, he didn't even mention the Mountain Meadows Massacre. And when BYU professors Ronald Esplin and Dean Jesse responded to an article in an Arkansas magazine in 1984 regarding the ordeal, they said, quote, the Mormons only became involved in the massacre when the Paiute Indians demanded their cooperation and were fearful of alienating their Indian allies if they refused to join. Meaning, go and murder because you're going to take the Indians off. That was their explanation. The Indians continue, even to this day, in one way or another, to take the full blame. In 1996, a state-sponsored booklet came out called The Official Centennial History of Utah, and it claimed that the Fancher Party abused the Paiute Indians, and then the book intimated that the Indians made the Utah militiamen join them out of fear. Uh, so even the government produces manuals that suggest the Indians did it and implicate the Mormons not whatsoever. In the early 1980s, when Ezra Taft Benson was ailing, um, Gordon B. Hinckley, who was in charge of the church essentially, agreed to help various associations rebuild and clean up the Mountain Meadows site. His only request for the participation was no movies be made. The stepping forward made some people think that perhaps Mormonism was actually going to step up and apologize. On September 15th of 1990, at a dedication of a $300,000 granite monument overlooking the meadows, Hinckley spoke. Bagley writes that after choirs sang and various people from all sides spoke, Hinckley took the stand. He said the event defied understanding and then, while seeming to be building toward an apology, he admitted that he had not come to apologize at all. Many people were dismayed and a benediction was said. Buses took people up to a hill where the memorial overlooked the Mountain Meadows site. And the monument, which was written primarily by a Latter-day Saint defender, said, in the passive voice, in the valley below, between September uh, 7 and 11, 1857, a company of more than 120 Arkansas immigrants led by Captain John T. Baker and Captain Alexander Fancher was attacked while en route to California. This event is known as the history of the Mountain Meadows Massacre, period. Three years later, members of the John D. Lee family gathered in the St. George Temple and did the rites and ordinances for the murdered Arkansas people. The irony of this is profound in my opinion. These people not only had their lives taken through violent bloodshed because of LDS doctrine, but according to LDS doctrine, they had to wait in spirit prison now for an LDS person to step up and do the vicarious temple rites in order for them to go to paradise. 
Back at Mountain Meadows, nature herself made work of that monument that was erected, and it was down within six years. Enter Gordon B. Hinckley again, 1998. Because the church now owned the land, he said that he came and looked upon it, and he said to himself, quote, you must do something to make this a more beautiful and attractive and lasting memorial. Instead of doing what truly would have been beautiful and lasting and healing, apologizing for the Brigham Young's role in instigating the uh, massacre at least, Hinckley responded by throwing money at the site, as much as say $200,000 to build a respectable memorial. Unfortunately, a new memorial meant digging in the actual grounds of the area and the third bucket scooped out of the earth produced 30 pounds of skeletal remains. The Fancher relatives went ballistic and even the archaeologists called in to examine the bones were hit emotionally hard by the sight of children with holes in their skulls. Presented with another opportunity to face their demons and apologize, nothing of the sort happened, which caused the Salt Lake Tribune to state that Governor Levitt, who at the time governed, uh, tried to avoid the controversy, and he produced what, quote, may be another sad chapter in the massacre's legacy of bitterness, denial, and suspicion. You see, my friends, if Mormon officials ever openly accept responsibility for anything evil that is tied to their doctrine or their teachings of the past or of the present, they open a door to scrutiny. They open a door to their people doubting them. Protecting the Mormon structure of power has always been their priority, not the truth, not healing people, not bringing families together, not the individual. Mormonism is the key. But until the leaders of the LDS Church officially accept responsibility for their institutionally authored deeds, and the bones, as it were, of these poor souls are going to continue to surface. It's a double standard because while Mormon leaders will tell individual men and women, you've got to step up and admit and confess all your faults to your priesthood leader, the institution has never done the same, ever. Not in renouncing the doctrines of polygamy, not in renouncing their doctrines on blacks in the priesthood, not in renouncing blood atonement, not in renouncing Adam God. None of it has officially come forward because they know no apology, no admittance of error, because the abuse and the power structure will crack. It'll be like the Wizard of Oz, and they'll pull the curtain back, and you're going to see a gray old man back behind there, skinny, sagging gray, naked skin, doing all the things and being terrified that he's going to be found out. Another memorial was held in September of 1999. This time, people gathered to rebury the remains of the victims and to celebrate a new memorial funded by the LDS Church. A Paiute tribal leader named Janiel Anderson attended and was asked afterward, how many Paiutes uh, were involved in the massacre? Anderson replied, that's your history, not ours. With much anticipation, Gordon B. Hinckley once again stood and spoke. Perhaps most thought the church will now finally just come clean and initiate a genuine healing, not a smarmy pass the buck homily. My dear friends, he began, this is an emotional experience for me. I come as a peacemaker. This is not a time for recrimination or for assigning blame. No one can explain what happened in these meadows 142 years ago, he said. It is time to leave it all in God's hands. Got that. Let's drop it. Let's just cover it up and leave it in God's hands, he seems to imply. But then he went on to describe that he went there and he, as a boy, and then he slipped into the Gordon B. Hinckley prototypical PR mode. He said, we have spent a very substantial amount of money on what has been accomplished here. We have not spared expense to do it right and in a fashion that will remain throughout the years. Then he spoke of the great effort of supplying the area with much electricity and water, making the site secure, attractive, and accessible. And then he continued, I sit in the chair that Brigham Young occupied as president of the church at the time of the tragedy. 
And Bagley notes that at this point, the audience saw a marked change in his demeanor, where before he was talking about uh, reconciliation and forgiveness and putting it behind, now he became defensive and said, I have read much of the history of what occurred here. There is no question in my mind that he was opposed to what happened. And then as, uh, as out of the blue, he made a legal disclaimer that said, quote, that which has been done here by us, meaning the money spent on this site, must never be construed as, as an acknowledgement on the part of the church of any complicity in the occurrences of that fateful day. Bagley notes that those who, know under, who understand Mormonism didn't expect him an, to outright make an apology, but nobody anticipated such a legalistic and such an explicit denial of accountability. He closed by letting everyone there know to, that he wanted to see this thing disappear and unambiguously said, let the book of the past be closed. Later, five years as, uh, after serving as the church president, Hinckley granted his first interview to the Salt Lake Tribune and a reporter asked him about the Mountain Meadows Massacre. Listen to Hinckley's word choice as he responded. He said, it was a local decision and it was tragic. We can't understand it at this time, but none of us can place ourselves in the moccasins of those who lived there at the time. <laughs> Even as late as the year 2000, the highest official of the Mormon church continued to tacitly blame the Indians. Let's going to open up the phone lines, 801-973-TV20, 801-973-8820. First time callers, please. LDS preferred. We're going to run a brief spot just to tell you about our partners program and come back and get your phones. We've got Kathleen, Karen, Michael, and Valerie waiting on the line. We'll take them in just a second. Hi, I'm Sean McCraney with Alathia Ministry, producer of Heart of the Matter. We exist solely on the support of those who appreciate our efforts at reaching others with the saving message from Jesus Christ. We want to invite you, if you're so inclined, to come alongside with us, partner with us financially. Now, all uh, support and prayers are greatly appreciated, but Heart of the Matter Partners, or HOTM Partners, has been carefully designed to supply support for Aletheia Ministries' long-term sustainability without burdening individuals too much. On your screen is an address. You can write to partners there, ask information, whatever you want to do, we'll send you a brochure. Also, if you're interested, you can check us out at www.hotm.tv. Additionally, you can call us, 1-888-868-4686. All prayers, all support are appreciated. God bless you. See you Tuesdays. Who was that guy? Hey, uh, listen, we're going to go to the phone lines, and uh, we appreciate any prayers, support, whatever you do. We love you. are grateful for it. Let's go to Karen, uh, first-time caller, LDS. Karen, you're on Heart of the Matter. Yes, hello, Sean. I appreciate the dialogue. I have a question that I've wondered about. Yeah. Harley P. Pratt was killed in the South prior to this Mountain Meadow Massacre. Yeah. And I was wondering if these pioneers that were traveling through were from the South and if that caused any pre-animosity, like were they talking about the death of Harley P. Pratt and that they would, you know, do have the same attitude as they were coming through St. George. In other words, was there a preconceived animosity between those people living in Southern Utah and these pioneers coming through? It's a great question, and absolutely. Parley P. Pratt was killed, and uh, rumor was had it... Arkansas or Alabama? I'm sorry. He was, he was killed in Arkansas, the same place where the Fancher Party originated, but not in the same vicinity. It was hundreds of miles apart. I see. And when they came through... Um, there were rumors. Now, I don't know what's true, but there were rumors that people said, the LDS people said, these guys helped kill Pratt, and Parley P. Pratt's new wife said, they're the ones who did it. So there, that, that, that's the one side. The other side is that some say that they were laying claim not to Pratt's death, but to helping kill Joseph, which makes no sense because Joseph was killed in Illinois, and they were from Arkansas. But, right, up the river, yes. Yeah. So, uh, but there was definitely this, um, 
this. Uh, we would call it trash talk today. Trash talk going on. Yeah, and, and that could have definitely contributed to the environment. Um, I think that uh, there was a lot of rumors going on about who they were. And I think personally, after reading Bagley's book and part of Juanito Brooks' book, is that it was uh, George A. Smith who actually was the one who got the whole thing going because he was down in the South. He actually passed the Fancher party on the road as they went down to their destiny with death. And, and he was an apostle and he returned to Brigham Young and the whole thing. And so I think that Apostle Smith was the one who stoked the fires. Well, what was the time frame? For, I mean, like, how'd they know they were coming? Uh, they say that Brigham Young knew everything that went on in the state. And as soon as anybody entered, because there was a threat of war, he yes, had sir. word passed along through the Indian Telegraph of what, where people were, who they were, what they looked like, what they owned, etc. I see. Yeah. So Parley P. Pratt was part of the impetus of this, of this mountain meadow? Yeah, it's certainly, it's certainly part of the, uh, what the possibilities could be. All right. Well, thank you for clearing that up. You're welcome. Appreciate thank, it. Bye. Thanks for calling. Bye-bye. Yes. We're going to Caitlin and Murray, uh, first-time caller. Caitlin, you're on Heart of the Matter. Hi, Sean. I have a quick question for you. Yes. Since Mormons believe that humans can become a god, where does the first god of Mormonism come from? And I'll get off the line so you can answer. Okay. Thanks, Caitlin. Bye. Yes. Uh, Latter-day Saints do believe that they can become exalted and they can become a god. I was just having a con lunch conversation with a good friend today, and we talked about how that's exactly what Satan said. Eat of this fruit, you can become a god. You can become as a god, you know? And so it's the same lie, but they do believe if they not only do the basic fundamentals of the gospel, and then they also continue on with all the other things, going through the temple, marrying celestially, being faithful and obedient, keeping their covenants, etc., etc., that when they die, they will become a god. The problem with who the first god is, is um, it's called an eternal regression of gods. And what they say is God had a father who had a father. And you just keep going back. And Caitlin, your question is unanswerable because there is no original source to them. It just is one eternal like infinity symbol somewhere along the line something happened. Just like when a good faithful Mormon dies, they are going to become a god in the line of gods. And it continues on and on and on and on. My thing is when you're talking to a Latter-day Saint, I say this. So you believe God had a father and some of them will say, well, we don't really believe that anymore. But your doctrine teaches that God had a father and that all these things couldn't be created and material couldn't be. Created. Yes, yes, yes. So he had a father. He had a father. He had a father. They say, yes, he had a father. Yes, yes, yes. And I say, when you get to the first father, that's our God. That's, that's, that's the one that we know. Okay. That's the guy that we like and worship. So everybody else, we don't want anything to do with. We just go to that first guy. He's the first and the last, the Bible calls him. Alpha and Omega. Ooh, novel idea. Not uncreated, you know. He's somebody you can trust because he didn't have to go through sin and things like that. He is the creator. He's not a man. All right, so that's about it. Let's go to uh, Michael in Ogden, first time caller. Michael, you're on Heart of the Matter. Michael? Hi, Hi Michael. Hey, uh, is this Sean? This is Sean. Okay, Sean. Uh, yeah, I want to make a quick comment, and I've got a uh, quick question, um, and then I'll get off and let you answer. Okay. I would like to know, first off, um, well, what you just mentioned a few moments ago about God, you know, what the Mormons, what the LDS members believe. Um, I'm ex, um, uh -huh. born again. I've got your book. Uh, but uh, as far as the, you know, God had a father, a father, a father, and you can't find a source, but really, you know, you can't find a source for the one true God either. I mean, yeah. I'll say that. Yeah. You know, the one true God, there is no source. You'll go crazy if you try to figure out who made God. Right. Because he's self-existent. But I was going to say, um, to, to my question is this. Do you believe, generally speaking, that LDS, because Gordon Hinckley, you know, his famous, one of his famous phrases was, each according to their own understanding. Do you believe that LDS members can go to, quote-unquote, heaven, the true heaven. And then the comment I wanted to make is, do you, know, I think in the, do you think this is just a coincidence? I think there's something to this. In the state of Utah, per capita, you know this already, they're uh, the leading per capita, antidepressants, uh, bankruptcy, trying to keep up with the Joneses, I guess, because it shows in the LDS church, you know, that shows a sign of, uh, you know, oh, God's, 
proud right. of us for doing good. And uh, methamphetamines, all these things. And then I'm going to go out on a limb here, and I hope I don't offend anybody, but autism. Early in the church, there were a lot of intermarriages, very close cousins that were marrying one another. Huh. And I wonder, I was reading something on the web that said that that could have something to do with it. Interesting. I haven't read anything about autism. I certainly have about, I've heard with meth use, especially in Ogden, and I've definitely heard about uh, antidepressants and porn use in Utah, all those things I've heard of. And I believe it's just a, an exact product of a legalistic yes. system. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I, I completely agree. So I want your opinion on that. And then about the heaven thing. And then, uh, oh, yeah, and then the other thing. And then I, I promise I'll get off right now. Give me 10 seconds and I'm off and let someone else talk. But uh, about the heaven deal, about that, and I'll let you answer that. And the other one, because you got a good mind, you'll remember. When Joseph was supposedly, you know, he was screaming out because he was a mason, you know. Yeah. Uh, he was screaming out. But he had revealed a lot of the secrets, you know like, what was it, two weeks after he became third-degree man, right. and he started endowing him, uh, I mean, he started the, uh, the temple endowments. So, yeah. You know, okay, the temple rituals, which were taken basically from masonry. Well, he wasn't supposed to do that, and back then they took it really seriously. You know, right. The oath that we will kill you. Right. It, and uh, they say that a lot of the people were actually masons. And um, so I'll get off the phone, and I'll let you answer these two things, okay? okay. All and right, my friend. Thank you, Michael. Hang in there, buddy. And I want to visit. Uh, do you, are you in Salt Lake yeah. or anything? Any Sometimes. Any churches? Hey, let's get to, just email me. Maybe we can get together. Well, I don't know your email. Yeah, just stay on the phone. The operator will give it to you. Hold on. Okay, thanks, bud. All right. He's just full of energy. Now, listen, um, as far as Mormons going to heaven, the heaven that Christians believe in, absolutely. I completely believe that. And uh, if I'm wrong, I'll let God say, you were wrong, Sean. And I'll be like, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, but I believe that completely because I know Latter-day Saints who do seek and know Jesus in the way that Christians believe in Jesus. Uh, they don't believe a lot of, in fact, I think the majority don't believe in a lot of what Mormonism teaches. Um, and so I think it's if they have received Jesus as their Lord and Savior, if they have uh, confessed him with their mouth, if they believe in their heart, if he, they've been born again and he resides in him, sure. I believe that there are Baptists and, and Pentecostals and, and Islam. Yeah. And I believe that there could be Hindus and I could be, believe there could be all people who are going to go to heaven and surprise the heck out of us because somehow God was able to work in them. OK, so I don't believe in the dogmatism of no them, yes them. And I also believe that there are many people in Baptist churches and Pentecostal churches and Christian churches and Mormon churches that aren't going to heaven because they don't have him. They have not that relationship. And Jesus said, you must be born again. This is a must. And, and, and so we talk about those things on the show and, and other places. You must have him. And that's the key. I talked to a, a woman today. I said, I, all your other things that you deal with in your life, and there are some things in her life. I said, who cares? Do you know Jesus? Is he the Lord of your life? Have you been born again? And well, well, have you humbled yourself? Have you seen that he is the only way? That's the key to it all, okay? Not mountain meadows or all this other stuff. These are just tools we use to get you to think, to then look at the doctrine. But have you been born again? Let's go to Galen, Salt Lake City, first time caller. Galen, you're on Heart of the Matter. Hello? Hello, Galen. Who is this? This is Sean. Hey, Sean, I just think that you're, all you're doing is judging some other religion just to get on TV. What? Anybody just can judge other people and put them down. That doesn't take a very smart person to do that. I think it's a bunch of crap. Bunch of crap, huh, Galen? Yeah, bunch of crap. Ah, Galen. Steven? Hey, Galen. Yeah. You realize that you're saying that I'm full of crap for what I'm doing, but I can't say another group is full of crap for what they're doing? Yeah, well, I'm saying that you're judging. So are you, Galen. I said judge not, be therefore not judged. Galen, you're and judging you me. you judging people. Galen. You know nothing about. You weren't there. Really? You weren't there when they put the uh, map, the... Uh, the kill a Mormon on site law by Governor Boggs. You weren't there. You can't judge it. You oh. just have a bunch of damn but books. Aren't you, you judging? But aren't you judging? Which one isn't? Aren't you judging me? You're a judger. Aren't you judging me? No. I'm telling you to repent. Quit judging people. I'm telling the Mormon Church to repent. Yeah, repent. Quit judging people. I'm telling you the Mormon to, Church to do you the don't same know thing. Damn thing about it. I don't. You weren't there. Only Jesus Christ will judge those people, not you. Well, and you're just trying to get people into your stupid thing by saying you're an anti-Mormon. Big deal. 
Well, you Gail, you are powerful. Anybody. You're convincing, man. I, I am ready to just quit it's right not now. It's about you. It's about Jesus, and you think it's about you. I think it's about me. That's not yeah, a judgment. you do, and you bring all up this crap. You know, Protestants were Nazis. There's so much crap to be brought up by anybody. Jesus Christ said, he that has the not sin, throw the first stone. So I would challenge you to quit throwing damn stones at people until you're perfect. Okay, Galen, can I speak now? Yeah. I just answered a question. Someone said, can Mormons go to heaven? I said, absolutely. I heard all that. It didn't matter, did it, to you? You, but you, you, you don't even... What? You, you, I, people are going to heaven because Christ is going to judge who's going and who's not. I agree with that, Galen. Right. I agree with that. But, hey. Galen, is there any group that you stand against in this world? No. You just love them all? I love everybody until... They're till they have proven that they have done wrong against me. Okay. And yeah. then if you have proof of that wrongness, would you then stand up? Um, maybe. Well, if you wouldn't. I wouldn't stand up. No, it depends. Yeah, uh, I would stand up like the Nazis. Okay, you would stand up against away my freedom. Okay. Yeah, I would stand That's up. a good example. Let's use the Nazis, for example. All of Germany was behind. Hitler gave them hope. He gave them oh, a I system. Know. He told them not to drink. He said, shut down your burlesque parlors. He gave them order. He gave them beautiful edifices of architecture. I he know. gave them uniforms. I think the parallel is supreme, Galen. You brought up a very good point. But you would fight against that very productive system because you believed it was wrong. Well, it, it turned out wrong. And they say, by your fruit shall you know them. So as soon as they set up concentration camps. That was enough for you live, then. Maybe we'll start judging them like we judge the Nazis. Okay, then let me ask you this, Galen. We have concentration camps as the result of Nazism. We just right. had a caller tell us that this state has the highest use of meth, porn, Prozac, teen suicide rate. I see people every day who are the fallout from this regime. You know what? That's nationwide. That's worldwide. How, how That's is Utah... To do with I, I realize it's, I realize world, it's worldwide, Nathan. I, I mean, don't believe that. Well, you cannot believe it, and that would because go right along with a good Latter-day Saint. There's a bunch of meth heads and drug addicts. Well, I'm not going to belabor it. Listen, years. I, not unique. listen I, I don't judge an individual. I never have. I don't believe that's my place, but well, I will... all. my great-great-great-grandfather. He supposedly, according to you, started the approved amount of massacre, even if he did... So what, huh? Yes, you're not going to judge him. Okay. And there's Mormons do good things. They're not out oh, there. Yeah, I do. You are you are boring me now. I, I've really tried to just listen to you, but your logic, your Mormons do good no, things. No, my stuff. logic is perfect, and yours is wrong because you're a judger, and you can get on TV and get famous. Big deal. That, that's what Big I'm doing, deal. man. Famous. It's for you. All right. Do you have any I'm more things you want to say? Your, I'll you let you say. Pretty good on TV. You have it. You're a nice looking guy. Oh, I'm sure a lot of people like you. All right, man. You take care. You too. All right. Bye-bye. I just thought I'd wear a sign that just says judger on it. I'm a judger. A t-shirt that says judger. Let's go to Steve Price, first time caller. Steve, you're on Heart of the Matter. Hello. Steve, you're on the air. Hey, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? Pretty good. i just calling in response to some of these comments that are coming in uh, regarding... Uh, the Mount Meadow Massacre? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's classic Mormonism to deny, obviously. Um, but uh, the comment I was wanting to say was there was a woman called in earlier, said something to the effect of uh, the, the tensions that were going on with uh, Carly Pratt. Right. And uh, my, my opinion on that is no matter what the tensions, this is supposed to have been a church that was set up to be the one and only church, the only way to get to heaven. Right. And in my opinion, if they were going to be this church, shouldn't they set an example for everyone? Absolutely, Steve. Your, price, your, uh, your point's well taken because, it, I mean, she brought up Parley P. Pratt. 
uh, who was shot, by the way, by the new wife's husband, who he took from her, and Brigham Young sealed her to him while she was still married to the man who shot and killed him for it. We forget that, but anyway, there is also the yeah. blood atonement thing going on. There is also retribution. There is also the wealth factor of the Fancher Party and the poor inhabitants of Southern Utah. There were so many. We've done so many shows on this. I'm dead to it. But there are so many factors that play into it. She brought up one. We just talked. But your point is really well taken. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. Um, just for uh, reference, I, I came out of Mormonism. I was in Mormonism for 40 years. Huh. And uh, I hadn't heard much about the Mountain Men of Metals Massacre while I was in Mormonism. Uh -huh. It wasn't until after the fact that I got out that I heard about it, uh, or in the process of getting out, yeah. and then had my name removed from it. Um, Galen, that was just on a minute ago, uh, is a classic uh, case. I would have probably been the same way as him at one sure. time, sure. So defending I. it to the end. And so. so would I. I understand, and I that's why played. I try to be more nice to him. I try. Yeah. God bless exactly. you, my friend. All right. God Thanks. bless you. Bye-bye. We're going to Curtis in Taylorsville. Curtis. Hi, Sean. Hi. First time caller. Yes. Um, my question that I have is, I, I know like in older temples and even on the, the one downtown that they have pentagrams on them. Yeah. Or, and, I, and I heard like Mormons would say like, oh, that was before Satanism. And it's mean like a unity. It's a good thing. And to me, I'm as being a Christian. I think a pentagram. I'm thinking, you know, the devil and stuff. And yeah. you know, what should I believe? Like, what is your opinion on that? My opinion is it's concurrent with the LDS, but however, with a caveat, the uh, use of the pentagram was borrowed from the Masonic use of the pentagram way back in France and from the Scottish Rite. And so their application of it to the temple doesn't have a tie to Satanism because it was Anton LaVey in the, this, actually in the, 18th, nine, the uh, 20th century who brought that symbol in and used it as the symbol for Satanism. But um, the fact that you have all the Masonic, which is just as horrific in my opinion, uh, where they would do all their Masonic stuff, all those symbols are on the Mormon temples. So I would step away from the, the Satanist stuff because the LDS will just say, that's not it. But I would definitely say, every one of those signs are part of masonry. Every single one of them. And then try to explain to them where masonry came from. And then have them read Duncan's book of Freemasonry, if they would. Which is a little small book. And it will blow their minds, if they've been through the temple, to see what Joseph took from masonry. And applied to what he calls the new and everlasting covenant. And the endowment. And all this other hocus pocus. Put up the veil again, you know. Good call, Curtis. I really appreciate it. Hey, thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. We're going to Valerie in West Valley City. Valerie, you're on Heart of the Matter. Well, hi there, Sean. How are you? Well, hi there, Valerie. I'm doing fine. I just wanted to make a quick comment about Brigham Young's knowledge of the Mountain Meadow Massacre. Yeah. I mean, that is provable hands down. His uh, 19th wife, Anne, wrote about it in her journal. And if she wrote about it, I'm sure there's other journals. Yeah. And the main thing, you know, I read a book by his niece, and they had that at Lighthouse Ministries, and it oh. was written back then. Hmm. And uh, the things in that book would curl your hair. And she emphatically oh, stated that he actually ordered that massacre. Wow. Well, there's a couple thoughts on that, um, Valerie. One is they went through, and they actually have documentation. I didn't include it in Bagley's stuff, but he says they went through and they gathered up journals. They went into houses and grabbed up everybody's journals who talked about it, and they got rid of them. Things were stricken from LDS Church records about it. So there was definitely a cover-up, and I would agree with you. The problem is proving it. I know uh, Eliza Ann and her, and her book, The 19th Wife, yes, but she was also... she. Uh, she also had an axe to grind, and, and so you're not sure how much was reality and how much. And so it, that, they re address that stuff, and we look for actual things where people record it. And that's what Bagley did, and that's why the stuff we've been presenting is so good. But Absolutely. But I, I want to pass on. Brigham, that book by Brigham Young's niece? Yeah. That's a documented thing. Is it? That's something you should get your hands on. It's at Lighthouse Ministries. Uh, utlm.org, go to utlm.org, www.utlm.org, and you can find all this information out, much more than what we have here on the show. Really appreciate it, Valerie. You're welcome. I love you. Love you too. Take care. Okay, God.
God bless. Bye-bye. God bless. Bye-bye. Uh, I have received a number of emails. In fact, I brought them to, to read, but we had good calls uh, tonight. But so many uh, are from people who have been Latter-day Saints who are now coming out. They want to believe in Jesus, but they don't. They, and and it happens more and more. And I read them more, and it's so sad. They said, I was sold such a bill of goods. I know that the bill of goods is, is right. They, they lied to me. And now I just don't believe in anything. And they ask, how can I know? How can I get reestablished? And so my advice to you is this. Um, don't trust me and don't trust uh, men and women. You can listen to them and their arguments, but take this issue literally in your mind's eye, gather up the whole thing. Like you close your eyes, gather it all up out of your head and heart. And in prayer, every day of, every, of the morning, just take it to the Lord and say, I don't even know if you exist, God. I am so burned out by what I have been taught. And now I know the truth. I don't even know if there's a Jesus. I had someone tell me today, I don't believe in Jesus at all, left the Mormon church. I, this is the advice. Take this and say, you show me. Not through the feelings. I'm not saying do the Mormon thing of Moroni 10.3 where you pray and you get a burning in your bosom. I'm saying, you show me, Lord, and you, you have this happen. And that's going to happen through him having you read from the, the word. It's going to happen through experiences through others coming up. You'll be saying, I don't even know if Jesus lives. And you'll bump into someone who will share Jesus with you. And you'll think, why would that occur. It's not about these feelings. It's about God working in your life and bringing things to show you. He is there. Jesus is real. He's a reality. He's a historical figure. Now, if you have the desire, open up the Bible. And, and we claim this is his manual. Open it up to the book of John. Start there and just start reading. And then to say, God, I don't even know if I believe this. You show me. Please change my heart. Help me see. Give me eyes to e uh, see, ears to hear, a heart to feel so that I can be converted, so that I can believe. And this is a step of faith, and it's, this is the key. It's got to come from a willingness to be humble before Him. It's your maker. You don't need to be humble before me. You don't need to be humble before the pastor or preacher unless the Lord leads you to there. But you just humbly go before this maker that we don't see, and you ask Him. And I promise you, if you do that in faith and humility and trusting, he would never turn you away. We're going to see you next week. Remember this Saturday, Logan, Utah, Open Water Baptism, 1 o'clock Saturday. Come join us. God bless you. See you next week on Heart of the Matter. Yay!